So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you uh, our speaker for the final plenary session. And our speaker, Professor Johanna Stachel, has quite a track record, so I could talk for a long, long time, but that's not what you're here for, so I will give you some highlights. So Professor Johanna Stachel started her career in Mainz, Germany, after which she went to Stony Brook, where she became a full physics professor. And later on, she returned to Germany, to Heidelberg, where in addition to being a physics professor, she was also the dean for the physics and astronomy department. And later on, she also served as the elected uh, director of the, <coughs> the, the, the president of the Deutsche Physikalische Gesellschaft. Her research study actually is about the quark gluon plasma, which is the topic of her keynote, and also was the topic of the, the session she gave on Monday to all the students. And there, she made groundbreaking uh, uh, contributions to the physics of hadronization in the quark gluon plasma and to the interaction of heavy quarks to study the deconfinement. Due to her research work, she was also elected as the spokesperson of the Ceres experiment at CERN, and she uh, led the, uh, the development of one of the key detectors in the ALICE experiment. In addition to that, in her full career, she also received many, many rewards, and just to list a few, she was a fellow of the American Physical Society, she received the Lisa Meitner Prize from the European Physical Society, and she's a member of the Academia Europea, and that goes on and on, but not to take more time away from you and from Johanna, then let's, without further ado, welcome Johanna Stachel to the podium and give her a warm welcome. Okay, so thank you for the kind introduction, Raymond. So I will take you on a journey, the final journey of this conference, and it is going to small systems. You heard in the first talk that we can now do microsco microscopy on the 100 femtometer scale. I will take you to scales that are five or 10 femtometer and to really extreme systems systems that have temperatures that exceed a few hundred thousand times the temperature in the interior of the sun, but that also live a fleetingly short time. The time it takes light to fly of the order of 10 femtometer only. And I will first introduce you to why we are interested in that matter and make some connections to the early universe. And then I will show you a little bit how and where we do the experiments. And finally, I will share a few observations of this extreme state of matter that we are creating. So we are here now. 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang, and what we are trying to do is we are creating in the laboratory matter that existed nanoseconds or microseconds after the Big Bang. There is quite a bit we know from astronomical observation. You see here the Hubble expansion that is studied quite well, the cosmic microwave radiation, the light that is coupled in the universe had a temperature of the order of 3,000 Kelvin and bound hydrogen could exist, and that carries us back to very, very early quantum fluctuations in the universe even before inflation. We know about the primordial elements that were formed in the first few minutes of the existence of the universe and that are still around, deuterium, helium-3, helium-4, lithium-6. And what I want to take you to is the time when the temperature of the universe exceeded in units of KT 160 MeV. That's of the order of 10 to the 12 Kelvin. And beyond this temperature, the universe consisted of quarks, gluons, neutrinos, electrons, photons, and that was basically the state of matter between 10 to the minus 12 seconds 
and about 10 microseconds. And that is the phase we are recreating in the laboratory. Now, I realize not all of you are particle physicists. Actually, probably the smallest fraction of you is. So let me introduce the few ingredients you need to understand the rest of my talk. Uh, quarks and gluons. So first of all, we have six types of quarks. You see them listed up here. And they are labeled with their masses in units of mass times speed of light squared. So mega electron volts. We have the up and down quarks, just two and five MeV. Then the strange and charm quark. 100 MeV, 1300 MeV, and then finally the bottom and the top quark. The top quark has nearly the mass of a heavy nucleus like lead. Um, there are the six corresponding antiquarks, and the interaction between the quarks is mediated by gluons, as indicated by these little spirals that connect the quarks in this cartoon. Now, there's one thing important about the strong interaction that you need to know, and that is that in addition to the electric charge, the quarks also carry one of three possible color charges, indicated here on the left as red, green, blue. And the antiquarks have the corresponding anti-charge, so take this just like a charge like a quantum number. And very differently from electromagnetism, the gluon also has color. It, in fact, has a color and an anti-color. And there are eight different types of gluons that mediate the strong interaction. Now, quarks don't occur freely in nature. They have been searched for and have never been found. Uh, they are confined. They are bound by the strong interaction into colorless hadrons. And there are two ways to do this, to come to colorless object. The one is to combine a quark and an antiquark of a color and an anticolor. And these particles indicated on the left we call mesons. And the other way to do this is to take three quarks of different colors. And these particles, like the proton, for instance, two up quarks, a down quark, or the neutron, two down quarks, an up quark, these are what we call baryons. And from these different quark types, we can form about 150 known mesons and about an equal number of known baryons. So there's a whole spectrum of particles out there, and the mass is not the mass of the bare quarks, but generated by a mechanism of spontaneous symmetry breaking. And so the proton and neutron have a mass of about a thousand MeV or one giga electron volt. So now that we know about quarks and gluons, I can introduce the state to you that we are interested in. And that is what is called the quark gluon plasma. By enormous heating or compression of matter, quarks and gluons are freed from their confinement. It's indicated on the left, either by heating, the individual quarks and gluons lose their identity, they don't belong to hadrons anymore, or by pressure. And both, in fact, is achieved in collisions of heavy atomic nuclei at high energies. So knowing this, we can come to what we call the phase diagram of strongly interacting matter. The two axes are the temperature and on the horizontal, the net baryon density, density of baryons minus antibaryons, and that is governed by a baryon chemical potential. And then at low temperature and at normal density, we have the hadronic world, that's the world we live in. And at high temperature and at high density, these quarks and gluons are liberated from their confinement. And the new state of matter that uh, was already conjectured in 1975 by two different groups, and that was soon thereafter called the quark-gluon plasma, is formed. And that is the state that existed in the early universe on a time scale 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 5 seconds. And that shall be the topic of my talk. Now, 
where does this transition occur? I said high temperature, how the high does the temperature have to be? Um, this is not easy to come by because the theory of strong interaction, QCD, has a coupling constant that is large and so we cannot do perturbation theory for the purposes I'm talking about today. But one can put the theory on a four-dimensional space-time lattice and solve it numerically. And the computation of the QCD equation of state has been one of the major goals of the Lattice QCD community since the 1980s. And what you see here in this graph is that since a few years, we really have a good and consolidated result on this equation of state. So let's concentrate just on the upper two curves. And what they show is the energy density in units of temperature to the force. This would be the trivial rise of energy density in a relativistic gas. And even if we divide this out, you see that this is steeply increasing. And this increase is due to the liberation of new degrees of freedom. So where the curve is low, we have hadrons, and then this rise is because the quarks and gluons that have many more degrees of freedom are liberated from the hadrons. You see this is steeply rising, and there is a pseudo-critical temperature of about 155 MeV. That is the current knowledge from lattice QCD. Now, where is on this phase diagram the early universe? In the early universe, we had nearly identical numbers of quarks and antiquarks leptons and antileptons, and so the early universe is coming down as this black arrow at zero baryon chemical potential, at 10 microseconds about, it is crossing the phase boundary, the quarks and gluons crystallize into hadrons, all the known about 300 species, mostly decaying rapidly, the universe cools further and then turns over and reaches at about 0.1 seconds, the point where normal nuclear matter is. Neutrinos decouple, light nuclei begin to form. And this homogeneous universe in equilibrium, this is what we can study in the laboratory by colliding relativistic nuclei. Now, how do we have to imagine such a collision to proceed that is sketched in this plot? Before the collision, the two strongly Lorentz-contracted nuclei approach each other. The energy density is the density of normal nuclear matter, so 0.16 giga electron volt per cubic femtometer. Then the nuclei hit each other. There is a compression and heating phase because a large amount of kinetic energy is lost and converted into heat and into new particles. And then after a relatively short time, what is the, called the quark-gluon plasma forms, and it is formed if the temperature exceeds the pseudo-critical temperature or if the energy density is in excess of about one giga electron volt per cubic femtometer, so in excess of about four, five, six times normal nuclear matter energy density. The system does not stay together very long, in fact, much shorter than in the early universe, only about the time it takes light to fly five or ten femtometer, and then it cools below the critical temperature, starts to expand and cool further, and eventually the non-interacting particles reach our detectors, and then from the measurement we try to piece together what happened before. Now, we do this at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN near Geneva. What you see here in the picture, the most prominent feature is actually Geneva Airport. And in the back, you see the Jura Mountains. Uh, the LHC is indicated as the circle. Of course, we don't see anything on the surface because it is 50 to 100 meters underground. Uh, but you see it is uh, breaching the border between Switzerland and France. 
And uh, what happens in the LHC is that protons and nuclei are accelerated to super high velocities. And to quantify what super high is, uh, if you would let photons and protons race around the 27 kilometer LHC ring once, then light would win by 0.2 millimeter. So that's what we mean when we say nearly the velocity of light. The kinetic energy of a proton is 7 tera electron volt or 7 times 10 to the 12 electron volt. And with this energy, of course, new things can be done. Um, now, in the LHC, we have up to 2,800 bunches of 10 to the 11 protons each, and they are circulating around the ring. They are about seven and a half meters apart, and each bunch has about the dimensions of a human hair, so diameter of about 10 micrometer, length of about 20 centimeter, and then one has to aim pretty well to bring at four points around the ring these bunches into collisions. And in the collision, kinetic energy is transformed into new particles, and those are observed with dedicated and specially built detectors. So, Already the accelerator construction itself posed enormous challenges. There are 1,232 superconducting dipole magnets with the highest magnetic fields that we can achieve in such large magnets, 8.3 Tesla. Uh, all in all, the accelerator is the largest superconducting magnet system, 10,000 magnets in total. And it is also a huge cooling plant, 700,000 liters of superfluid helium at 1.9 Kelvin distributed, of course, all around the ring. So this is really uh, the coldest place on Earth, and with it, we make the hottest systems one can make. Now, the operation also poses its challenges. Uh, just to tell you, the energy stored in each of the colliding beams is equivalent to an ICE train at a speed of 150 kilometers an hour. And uh, so you see these two trains approaching each other. However, the collisions themselves are not dangerous. Only the smallest part of this energy is released in the collisions, only one part in 10 to the 11 each time the beams are crossing. The only thing is the beam should never be derailed and, and hit something. Huh? That would be disaster. Now, even more uh, enormous is the energy that is stored in the magnets. 10 gigajoule. That is the energy, uh, for instance, as an A380 airplane flying at 700 kilometers an hour has. And so that means certainly that great care has to be taken and great care is taken in operating this, this machine. Now, what we do at the LHC are nuclear collisions. And if two nuclei at these energies collide, the energy is really macroscopic. Two lead nuclei colliding at the LHC have an energy of 1123 TeV. This you can already express in joule. Uh, it's 0.2 millijoule, 5,800 5, times the mass of the two nuclei. In fact, you could hear individual collisions if they wouldn't happen in vacuum. Of course, in vacuum, sound doesn't travel, so it is, uh, in that respect, quiet enough. And with these energies, one can, for the first time, access very small dimensions. One can access masses at the Terra scale, and one can create matter as it existed in the early universe, and, and that is my topic. Now, the experiments are underground, where the LHC is. There are four experiments. One of them, Alice, is dedicated to heavy ion collisions and was also specifically designed for this purpose. But all four of the experiments are, in fact, studying uh, nuclear collisions. 
this is just to give you an idea how such an experiment looks like. In, in the bottom, you see two normal sized physicists. So these experiments are big. That's one thing. Well, houses are big too. But what is special here is that they are filled with lots of sophisticated equipment that is, has to all be custom developed and built by the scientists working in the experiment. In case of Alice, these are 1,800 scientists from 174 institutes, 42 countries. And just to give you an idea, 130 of them are uh, from Germany where I'm working. Um, one of our dedicated detectors that we need, and you will understand this when I show you the result of one collision, uh, that we need to track the many particles is a very large time projection chamber. This is a three-dimensional gas detector. Uh, it can reconstruct tracks of up to 15,000 charged particles in one collision. It is with about 100 cubic meter, the largest TPC, but I would uh, say it is also the best TPC that has been built so far. It has the size, as you can see here, this is a TPC from the inside of a comfortable, nice room. It is filled with gas. The ionizing particles traverse the gas. They ionize it. There is a strong, very homogeneous electric field. And in this field, the electrons drift to the end. And we measure in two dimensions the space point where the electrons arrive. And we measure the time when they arrive. And knowing the electric field, we can then compute back which point they came from. And we do this in all three dimensions better than 500 micrometer. So you can imagine this detector basically as a camera with 560 million readout pixels. Of course, this is also a tremendous data volume. And if we do this a few hundred times per second, we have to store a few gigabit per second in terms of data. Now that shows you the inside of the TPC before the chambers are installed. And uh, this feature, all of these stripes you see around, this is a precision field cage so that we have an electric field that is homogeneous and known to better than 10 to the minus 4. This is a picture of the magnet still empty, still without detectors. And uh, initially, we had a hard time to imagine if we would ever fill this. But now it is completely full with all the things we constructed. And uh, so once the detector is installed, the big doors are closed. And then the beams can come and collide. This is a photo of our control room when people were, in fact, waiting for the first collisions to happen. And then this is it. Uh, this is a reconstructed central lead-lead collisions, actually one of the first ones that we took on the first day of heavy iron collisions, November 8, 2010. And what you see in this picture are tracks of about 3,000 charged particles covering angles from 45 degrees relative to the beam on one side to 45 degrees on the other side, and asymusally symmetric. And from this, we have to piece together what the state of matter was before. So we form this fireball. It is radiating photons and electron pairs all the time, already in the plasma phase. And after it hadronizes, uh, it emits protons, pions, kaons, whatsoever. And um, we measure these in, for each collision. Now, since nuclei are extended objects of dimensions of uh, lead nucleus, 15 femtometer diameter. Of course, we can steer the beams with micrometer precision, but not with femtometer precision. So we will get all impact parameters randomly. Sometimes the collision is very central, sometimes it is peripheral. And the way to know what the impact parameter was is to look for observables that scale with 
the impact parameter of the collision. For instance, the multiplicity of produced particles, it goes up the more central the collision is. And one takes such an observable proportional to the multiplicity, and then we slice it into pieces, and we would take, for instance, the highest 5% of the multiplicity, and we can convert this to how many nucleons were participating, and that would be on average of the 2 times 208, this would be 384. And so we can then look in slices and decreasing centrality, but today we will look mostly at the most central and most violent collisions. Now, the first, let, let's come now to some physics results. The first and most basic quantity is just to look how many particles are produced. What I show you here is uh, this number, charged particles produced as a function of the angle. This quantity eta, the pseudo rapidity, is just minus log tangent theta half. So we start at five and a half. This would be one degree relative to the beam. We go to zero, that's 90 degrees perpendicular to the beam, and then we go to one degree on the other side. And if you integrate this distribution, there are about 15,000 charged particles here. The maximum lies at about 1,600, and the significance of this is that if the expansion from the initial very hot phase till the end is isentropic, then we can take this final multiplicity and convert it back to an initial energy density. And that is a recipe that was given to us by Björkén already in 1983 in a, in a beautiful paper. And if you do this, then this multiplicity density of 1600 translates into an initial energy density of about 140 giga electron volt per femtometer. Now, if you remember what I told you about the critical energy density in order to make for gluon plasma, this was one GV per cubic femtometer. So, so that means we are well beyond, far beyond the critical energy density. The temperature that corresponds to this is about four times the critical temperature. And there is also in this system, because of the high energy density, a tremendous pressure. I translated it to Pascal for you. Eight times 10 to the 36 Pascal. A totally unimaginable number, even for me. And that means that the system is driven apart by this pressure, and it will, in the end, expand very rapidly. Now, the next question we can ask these 26,000 produced hadrons, what are they? What types are they? And that is going to teach us a lot. So what I show you here is I have plotted the abundances as a function of the mass. And in this plot you see on the top with the smallest mass, the lightest particle, pions, then come kaons, protons, then come baryons with strangeness like lambda, cascade, omega, three strange quarks. Um, then nuclei, deuterons, helium-3, I should say these are particles and antiparticles, so anti-helium-3 nucleons uh, with a nucleon replaced by a lambda particle, and finally down at the bottom, helium-4. And what you see is that there is this more or less exponential fall-off with mass. And so what can you do? How can you understand this? You can take the system and describe it as a statistical ensemble. The simplest statistical ensemble, a grand canonical ensemble that only needs the masses and quantum numbers of the particles and that has in this case one free parameter and that is the temperature. And what you see is with every point these little blue lines, these are the yields you get if you fit this one free parameter to the data, and you see that over nine orders of magnitude, the data are very well described, and the temperature is 156.5 plus minus 1.5 MeV. So that's very close to the temperature I showed you is calculated as the pseudo-critical temperature. In fact, this has been done uh, we have done this at lower beam energies, and what I show you in the left plot are the parameters that are 
derived from such analyses at lower energies. This is a function of the center of mass energy. And look at the top left plot. What you see is that at lower energies, the temperature first is increasing with increasing energy. That is plausible, right? You are heating the system, you are bringing in more temperature, but then it levels off. Yeah, from 10 on this scale on out to a few thousand, it levels off. That means we are hitting a wall. The hadronic system can obviously not have a larger temperature. And um, the biggest difference at the LHC compared to lower energies is in fact that matter and antimatter are produced in equal portions. So what you see in this plot is the ratio of antiprotons to protons as a function of the momentum for central collisions, and within 1% accuracy, this is equal. The same can be said, but with lower statistical accuracy for deuteron to anti-deuteron, and we even have measured 10 anti-helium nuclei. So let's come back to the phase diagram. We can plot these points, these pairs of T and mu for each beam energy now into the phase diagram that I showed you initially, T and baryon chemical potential. And what you see is uh, as the uh, blue line, the limiting temperature that we find experimentally of 159 plus minus three MeV. And, aha, uh -huh, there is a gray band which doesn't show in this plot. So <laughs> I have to explain to you how it looks with the gray band. There is a, the result of the lattice QCD is where this gray arrow is pointing. There is a band that goes basically at a constant temperature, 154 plus minus 9 MeV, from the left end of this plot out to about 200 MeV in chemical potential. And that band, if you imagine 154 plus minus 9, is completely coinciding with the experimental points out to mu B equal 200. So that means the temperature at which hadron yields are freezing out coincides with the computed hadronization temperature when the quark-gluon plasma goes back to normal hadronic matter. And that is, in fact, not an accident. It has very deep reasons. Now, let me skip one topic so that we have uh, enough leisure that I can explain to you what we know about a confinement or deconfinement. And for that purpose, we will look at Charmonia. Charmonia are bound states of a charm and an anti-charm quark. In particular, an interesting state is the so-called J-Psi. This is the triplet 1s state of a CC bar. It has a mass of 3.1 GeV, about half the size, half the radius of a proton. And the original idea was by Matsui and Satz already 30 years ago to implant charmonia in the quark gluon plasma. And if you have a plasma with free color charges, then something completely equivalent to the Debye screening should happen. Namely, when the radius of the particle and the Debye radius agree, this resonance should dissolve. And so there was a prediction of sequential melting of charmonium states depending on what their size is. Now, if you think this to the end, of course, uh, let's assume the quark-gluon plasma screens all the interactions. The charm quarks are not bound anymore, but they are produced in hard initial collisions and they stay around. You can convince yourselves with calculations that they don't disappear. They are in the plasma, they cool with the plasma, and when the quark-gluon plasma hadronizes, when it reaches this 154 MeV temperature, then the charm quarks will also hadronize, and they could form charmonium at this point. Now, at high energies, at the colliders, you have many charm quarks in the system because the cross-section is steeply rising with energy and the yield should grow quadratically with the number of charm quarks. So, this is sketched 
For low energy, like RIG, in the top, you have one cc bar, then the, it dissolves, the quarks diffuse apart, and at hadronization, you make D mesons. Each charm quark ends up in a hadron. Now, at the bottom is the situation. At the LHC, you have many CC bars. They are deconfined. They drift around. They diffuse in the plasma. And at hadronization, you have a good chance to make charmonia. So if we look on the right-hand plot, if we look at the yield of charmonium, normalized to a proton-proton collision. So if nothing new happens, this, this would be one. Then if we increase the centrality or the energy density of the collision, at low energies you see this suppression, and the data points drawn here are the data points for RIG. So you see this fall off, but at the LHC, you have a much larger charm cross-section, you have more charm quarks in the system, and therefore you should not see this fall off anymore, but constant values or maybe even increasing values. And so this charmonium enhancement as a fingerprint of deconfinement was a true prediction many years before the data were taken. So this is succinctly plotted by Helmut Satz just the year we started to take data. So either it is just the sequential suppression or deconfined charm quarks at hydronization make charmonium, and then we could see a drastic enhancement. Now, this is not an easy measurement, uh, but it is doable. And uh, the way we do it is JPSI decays with 6% probability into a muon pair or into an electron pair, and by measuring these electrons or muons and taking always pairs of them and reconstructing their invariant mass, you can identify charmonia as a peak at the right mass at 3.1 GeV. Now, if you look at the, the right-hand side, for instance, at the top, you see there is a huge combinatorial background that comes from the fact that there are plenty of electrons that come from decay of charmed mesons, D mesons or B mesons, uh, but most of them don't come from shape size. So you have to very carefully measure the shape of this combinatorial background. You subtract it, and then you are left with what you see in the bottom. You have a nice peak. You can measure the yield. You do this as a function of the collision centrality. You do this as a function of the momentum of the shape size, and then we look what we get. So this, this is the result. What is shown here is the yield of charmonia normalized to proton-proton collisions, scaled with the number of binary collisions, as a function of the multiplicity, and that is proportional to the energy density. So to the right on this axis here, the energy density is growing, and what we see is the blue points in these two plots is RIG. These are lower energies, and measured in the left plot at forward angles in the laboratory and at, in the right plot measured at 90 degrees, what we call mid-rapidity. And then the red points are the LHC. And you see, if you compare it to this sketch that I showed you before, the prediction is clear which possibility is realized in nature. Right? We have a very strong increase in charmonium production with increasing energy density and also going from forward to mid-rapidity. This increase we expect because the charm yield is peaking at 90 degrees, just like the yield of charged particles I showed you in an, in an earlier plot. So to make this more quantitative, we can take what we know uh, about the charm production cross-section, and these are the two bands you now see in these plots. If we take the 
still rather poorly measure charm production cross-section. This is an even more difficult measurement. And you calculate how many charmonia you would expect from completely deconfined charm quarks at hadronization. Then it is in the left plot the black line and this band around it and the blue band in the right hand plot. And you see that this is completely consistent with the experimental data. And our effort in the next yeah, I would say at least five years, maybe seven or eight years, is to measure this charm cross-section with a precision of a few percent so that we can really come to, to precise uh, statements here. Now, the last piece of data I want to show you is that we can also look at this quantity as a function of the momentum of the JPSI. I, we take here the momentum perpendicular to the beam. Now, this statistical recombination at hadronization requires, of course, thermalized charm quarks. And this will be most likely happening if the momenta are low of the order 1, 2 GeV. And what you see now, the red points are the points at mid-rapidity at 90 degrees. You see that these points even exceed 1. So we have more than we would have in a proton-proton collision with nothing happening at all. At forward angles, this is somewhat less because the charm yield has this property. It peaks in the middle at 90 degrees and it is falling off forward and, and backward. So, so this is entirely consistent and I could show you if we had time more observables that, that show that we really have a consistent picture. So, so let me conclude uh, this journey by repeating the main messages for you. The quark-gluon plasma is produced in high-energy nuclear collisions and experiments we are doing at the colliders really now also start to characterize and quantify the properties of this medium. Properties like the speed of sound, like the heat conductivity, like uh, viscosity, like uh, diffusion coefficients, and so on. I could show you only a very small piece of, of what we are seeing. Uh, hadron production follows a statistical ensemble, and the measured points of hadron abundances delineate the phase boundary to the quark-gluon plasma as it is now calculated in lattice QCD. The plasma, I couldn't show that to you for time reasons, undergoes a Hubble-like expansion, a linear velocity profile, the farther away the particles, the faster, and at the surface, it moves with three-quarter speed of light. Um, from looking at correlations, we find that this is in fact a strongly interacting liquid. It has sensitivity to the early quantum fluctuations, and like in the Big Bang, these early fluctuations survive the propagation through the medium until the very end when the particles decouple. So like they are imprinted in the cosmic microwave background, in our case they are imprinted into the spectra and correlations of pions, of kaons, and so on. Um, heavy quarks also thermalize in this plasma. This was really quite a surprise because this is like a truck driving into a room full of ping pong balls and then you wonder does it stop in there or doesn't it? It does if the interaction is strong. Uh, that's the answer to, to this question. And finally, J-Psi, Charmonia, we see the predicted enhancement at the LHC as a probe of deconfinement. Uh, and this is completely in line also with spectra and other uh, more complicated and more involved quantities. So that's the end of this journey, the end of my talk, and I thank you for your attention.